Okay, I think we will start now. Um, can you can you hear me? Is the sound good? Yes, great. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, workshop. Um, I'm very happy that we are in a high number um, and that we have participants from both Romania and Norway and perhaps um, some other places as well. Um, I am uh, Christina Buta. I am the artistic director of uh, Sector One Gallery in Bucharest. Um, and just to briefly mention, uh, Sector One Gallery is a contemporary art gallery. Uh, we are located in Bucharest, Romania. Uh, we have a mixed program um, of exhibitions that we put up in our space uh, where we um, also exhibit uh, artists that we represent, contemporary artists and also a few uh, historical artists that we represent. And we also invite artists for our programs and uh, guest curators. At the moment, uh, we have an exhibition program which is titled um, Improving the... We have a, a not only an exhibition, but also um, a collateral events program. So this, this program uh, lasts for two years and it's uh, titled Improving Cultural Entrepreneurship and Access to Culture by Organizing the Series of Exhibitions on Master and Medium. Um, and uh, this is a, a, a project which we do in collaboration with uh, VISP in uh, Norway, an organization for visual arts, um, for resource and networking. And I will just very briefly uh, let uh, Veronica, uh, who is um, uh, from this part, um, project manager, just say a very um, briefly a couple of words about the activities that, that VISP does. Please, yes. Veronica. Thank you, Christina. Uh, so my name is Veronica. I'm from VISP, which is a resource and networking organization for the visual arts in Norway. So we are representing all of the creative community with the visual, within the visual arts, including artists, galleries, institutions, producers, curators, critics, and suppliers of materials and services. So we have our head offices in Bergen, but we also have an office in Oslo, and we are covering all of Norway with our operations. So we're a membership organization and membership is free. So please do not hesitate to reach out if there is any questions or if there's anything we can help you with. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, so um, within the program that we are setting up together with VISP for these two years uh, that I just mentioned, uh, it includes the series of three workshops of artist branding, of which uh, artist branding and entrepreneurship in the arts. Uh, the first of which is um, today, the session today. Um, and this session focuses on uh, the visibility of the artist that together with the gallery or maybe independently, it depends. I think Iman will tell us more about this, uh, can increase um, his, his brand, can maintain his brand, which is something that the um, arts um, uh, field is uh, very much in some cases um, having a challenge uh, with. Um, in order to, uh, before I briefly uh, move on to introduce uh, Iman, our mentor today and our guest speaker, I just want to um, quickly ask everyone uh, to uh, complete a short uh, poll, which has two questions. Uh, if you uh, look at the um, bottom right uh, screen, there is a, a, a poll, and I think Veronica can just, yes, pop it onto the screen. And if you would please want to complete this, because we would like to know more about um, whether you are a curator or an artist and um, where do you come from. So I will just give you guys couple of seconds to do this. And in the meanwhile, I just want to, to thank um, Aslak Hoyersten from VISP, who is not with here as now, but he's our main partner in this project. And also my colleague, Andreas Tanculano, who is the founder of Sector One Gallery. And... Let's see, I see that the poll is completed. Yes, 
Yes. Great. Thank you. And uh, now I will just um, introduce um, Iman, Iman Okain, uh, who is today our guest mentor for the session or artist branding, uh, is an artist living between Norway and Denmark. Uh, he uh, has been a professor, professor of visual art and painting at the Art Academy, University of Bergen in Norway. Uh, his multidisciplinary practice has been drawn to architectural context uh, with works such as the glass house that presented the scale model of Philip Johnson's iconic glass house, which was exhibited at California 101 in San Francisco. Um, he has exhibited widely in um, exhibitions uh, curated by Dan Cameron, Lynn Cook, Klaus Ottmann, among others. Uh, he has been the recipient of the Taylor Art Award, of a Fulbright Award, on an EV plus A Open Award, and the CCI Residency in Paris, and the Paula Krasner Foundation Grant, among others. Um, Iman Okain has been shortlisted for the IAB Prize, the PS1 Studio Fellowship in New York, and has had over 80 solo exhibitions internationally, including in art biennials and in institutions. And uh, today, Iman will uh, explore topics related to artist branding, which includes working with galleries, uh, research and brand monitoring for artists, and developing and protecting your brand as an artist uh, in collaborations. I'm really looking forward to uh, hear Iman and hear more about uh, these topics, which are very relevant to artists, but also to galleries, of course, and other art uh, professionals. And um, I will let Iman just uh, take the floor. Um, if, if you have questions, just feel free to ask them either in the chat and we will have a short uh, a session of um, a discussion at the end of the talk, which will last two hours in total. And uh, perhaps even if you would like to, in the middle, have a, a small break, uh, just um, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christina. And uh, thank you to you and Alina and Sector One Gallery, and also to Veronica and Aslak at, at VISP for inviting me. Um, it's a, a real privilege to, uh, to to take up these topics today. Um, it's quite a complex landscape, so I'm going to try and keep it as simple as possible. But I've got something like 150 slides, so um, it's a, it's a lot to take in. So we might need to break in the middle. Um, I'm in Greenland right now. I'm just going to start um, uh, sharing my screen. Um, so I hope the internet connection is going to can everybody see that okay? Yes. Yes. And still it's there. Yeah. 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 Great. Um, yeah. So I hope the internet connection is going to hold up. Um, uh, the um, This is the view from my uh, apartment window. Uh, uh, there's lots of icebergs floating by. It's very cold outside, but lovely sunny weather. Um, I will just uh, say that um, the, the talk today, um, I'm going to try and make it as practical as possible because I felt that it would be good to have as many, um, uh, to introduce as many tools as possible for um, artists to think about uh, developing their, their brand. And I'm also going to problematize the, the idea of entrepreneurship and branding within the arts a little bit like uh, Christina mentioned it is quite a complex uh, topic and it is very difficult for artists to um, uh, kind of figure out what branding means for them and I'll, I'll sort of explain a little bit about that in the talk. So um, traditional branding this is kind of an eight point uh, step point for, uh, of traditional branding where if you were uh, a company or uh, any sort of organization, you might take this type of approach. Um, a good few years ago, uh, one of my colleagues, Brandon Nobel, he um, was doing a talk and he talked about um, 
this idea of the sovereignty of the artist. And what he was referring to there is that we as artists, um, we kind of um, create our own um, uh, kind of uh, spaces in which we work, uh, not, not just uh, physical spaces, but also conceptual spaces. Um, and within the, that kind of idea is that we are the experts of what we do. Um, and of course, that would mean maybe um, uh, logically that you would, you would sort of think, well, that's very easy to brand then, very easy to construct an idea of what you do. Um, but the other paradox within all of this is that um, a lot of the things that are maybe treated as, um, as kind of uh, negative things within uh, the, the society we live in today, contemporary society today, um, uh, are actually uh, positive things being an artist. So for example, things like um, uh, play, uh, which is maybe sort of seen quite facile in the, maybe the business world, although it depends on, on, on uh, what companies you're talking about. Uh, boredom, failure, all of these different things are kind of active parts of a, a process of, of working as an artist and, and developing uh, one's work. So the, some of these topics um, uh, or some of these points do work, um, but one has to be a little bit careful about uh, becoming uh, too instrumental with one's own practice in relation to uh, trying to, to build uh, a brand. And um, I'll show some examples of uh, different technologies that are emerging at the moment. They, Actually, they've been, some of them have been emerging over the last 20 years, um, but they're becoming more and more sophisticated, especially using algorithms and so on. And in a way, what I'm suggesting with this talk is a, a type of um, uh, possibility for artists to hack the system. Um, and uh, of course, this can relate uh, to uh, other arts professionals as well that are using these, uh, these tools. So I'm not meaning to sort of belittle some of these tools as uh, what, what their values are, but I also want to sort of point out the potential that artists can have agency within this um, discourse. So I'll just go through these, um, these uh, pointers first. So think analytically, um, that's one of the, the pointers. Now it's difficult to, um, in a way, kind of think analytically necessarily um, if, if you're setting out as an artist or even if you're in the middle of your career, because of course you want to develop your work, but not to sort of instrumentalize it within another system to kind of like think, well, uh, what is my market? What is my uh, being strategic and so on? You want to uh, perhaps, and you know, some artists may want to think that way and that's completely um, open as well but you may perhaps want to kind of um, keep this possibility for play, for um, openness, for uh, developing your work in unexpected, uh, unexpected places. And I can give you the example of, for example, in the, in the science world, I'm here in Greenland because of um, a, a climate science project. And in the science world, um, you establish a set of uh, research questions before you embark on, on a particular uh, uh, science uh, research project. And then um, by and large, you're uh, uh, trying to, to prove those questions or to answer those questions through, uh, through a process of research and analysis. Now that's not always the, the case because the, within the art practice, of, co or of course, within artistic research and doing a PhD, that is an aspect of it, but um, very often within the artistic process, it's um, uh, maybe uh, the, the actual journey becomes the, uh, the setting out of these questions rather than the questions being set out at, at the beginning. So thinking analytically sometimes can be problematic within that case. Maintain your brand, that's important. And I'm gonna go into uh, quite concrete ways we can maintain our brand um, within uh, this talk. Uh, target your market. Now, that is also a complex one because, um, if, of course, it's a chicken and egg thing of which thing which comes first. You know, uh, do you make the work for the market or do you make the market uh, the sort of um, make your work and then see if you can find a market? So, in terms of that targeting the market, it's a kind of um, 
you know, you're not trying to necessarily be strategic. It goes back to the think analytically, not trying to be strategic and go, okay, here's a gap in the art world and I'm going to fill that gap. Now, of course, some artists might want to work that way and that could also be a conceptual starting point, but by and large artists won't be thinking in that way. Commit yourself to a brand. Um, now, I, th I would say that that is probably a good idea, but um, even with an artistic practice to commit yourself to your own practice, to your own uh, world building, um, uh, and to your, as Brandon would say, this, this kind of idea of the sovereignty of an artist. Um, but of course, you want op opportunities to um, develop or to change track or to do different things, and that might uh, conflict with that. Uh, create a unique value proposition. Now, I'm not sure that that is uh, essential for, for an artist. Of course, uh, the big question of the new is something that is very, um, uh, very much kind of focused on within, um, within the art world and the art market, this kind of idea of doing something new. But as we know from looking back in art history, there, it's very, very difficult to uh, have this kind of idea of something being completely new. It's maybe new for the time, but it's uh, definitely, there's a, there's a lot of art history there backing it up. Um, uh, speak with one voice. Now that is something that can be quite um, uh, important. And I think it's important to establish your own voice. And uh, in a previous uh, presentation, which I'll give you the link of in the chat uh, for this, I did a, um, uh, presentation at Bergen Assembly uh, on a portfolio preparation. And one of the things there is to, you know, as an artist, to tell your story. And I guess that is also being able to speak with one voice. But in a way, this speak with one voice is also talking about speaking with one voice of, across various platforms. And that brings us to number seven, which is having a, a dedicated marketing plan. Again, uh, of course, you can take this approach with, within an art uh, practice, and maybe it is appropriate for some people, but um, I think maybe things like um, sending out newsletters, emails, uh, but not this sort of idea of, of a kind of um, blanket marketing or taking adverts in, in uh, you know, freeze or art monthly or art forum or whatever. These these type of things would be done in uh, collaboration with uh, with a, if you're working with a gallery, uh, and would be quite strange for an artist to take that uh, on board. Although there are exceptions to that rule, and then aim to build a strong online presence, um, and that's something that um, is very true of uh, artists just as much as any any other business. Now, this is a, a quote by um, uh, the uh, artist Mark Glecky, and it was in a recent interview with him uh, on the podcast. And I would say, actually, podcasts are great, uh, you know, while you're in the studio or while you're traveling to work, work whatever, you should listen to artist interviews, uh, just search through. Uh, we could even do a whole talk on podcasts, actually, uh, different podcasts that are, are very relevant for um for artists in your practice. And, uh, and I find it something that um, I often will listen to, not necessarily uh, on being an artist, but it may be on uh, other topics that I'm interested in. But in a way, Mark Leckie said this in an interview, and I think it's a paraphrase from a William Blake quote. And what he was referring to there is, is this um, space of uh, kind of utopian space that he enters when he uh, works as an artist when he goes into his studio. He has a small studio at home where he uh, realizes or imagines up his projects. And he says when he's sitting at the, um, the computer screen, uh, editing a, a new piece of video work or coming up with a new, new project, uh, he just feels as if he's in this, this type of paradise. And I think that's the type of thing that we really need to maintain through all of this. So when I'm talking about all these um, very uh, systematic and uh, kind of structured uh, online tools or online algorithms and so on. Please take it with a pinch of salt because, you know, I'm not proposing that all of these things are the way for everybody or how to use them. The idea of hacking them uh, is, is the most important uh, thing for me um, rather than kind of thinking that we should maybe 
take them as a type of uh, gospel of a, of a way to be a, become a successful artist or something like that. Okay, so just back to um, this idea of, of building a career, building a, a brand or a world building or a kind of a, a, con a construction of what your, your own artistic career might be. Um, it, time is, is very uh, important to artists. And one of the things I'm gonna try and do in this talk is to uh, use myself and my own experience over the last few years as a way of um, explaining how I've uh, tried to um, uh, gain more time for myself and my practice, because that's that's the uh, one of the most important things. It's maybe even more important than uh, uh, necessarily getting the work out there. Of course, that's super important as well, but you need to make the work first. So you need time to make the work uh, in your studio. And there's a lot of online tools that we can use as artists that saves time and also maybe saves money that would otherwise have been spent on uh, getting assistance or getting other people, other professionals to, to help us. Um, so I'll go into that in a bit. But, but uh, number one, be patient, realistic and diligent. It takes time to build an art career. And this kind of idea of overnight success is overrated and very random. Um, it's also it can be quite dangerous uh, where you sort of get dropped into something that you're not expecting. And if you're not uh, prepared for the things that are coming, then it can um, have uh, negative consequences. So uh, just be serious and committed to your art career and, uh, and, and also be patient with it as well. Uh, and I think that often maybe comes with the benefit of hindsight, of course. Um, set realistic and challenging goals, write them down. Um, there's something about writing things down that make, can make them official. Uh, where do I see myself in my art career in six months, one or two years from now, uh, for example? Now, I'm not talking this about this as something where they're more almost like thought experiments. It's not something that you have to hold yourself to and also feel guilty over if you don't achieve these goals. It's more like a, a process. Um, I remember years ago uh, when I was teaching in, in England at the University of the West of England, my boss at the time uh, invited me in for a meeting. He was the, the dean of the faculty, and um, uh, he said uh, we were having a conversation about uh, different things in teaching and my career and stuff. And he said, "So, what's your five and ten year plan?" And I was just completely thrown about this. I just didn't know how to answer him, and um, I probably wouldn't know how to answer him now. And that's okay, <laughs> but it's okay also to write down these ideas. Um, no, I said I just wanted to continue doing my artwork, artwork and I wanted to continue teaching, uh, the working with students, and he couldn't see <laughs> that that was like a, a valid way of uh, thinking of things. But um, I think it, it can be quite um, small steps as well. It doesn't have to be about uh, achieving, uh, you know, it's being patient uh, as well. Uh, think ahead and create an action plan. Add a deadline to each of your goals. What do I need to do right now? And where do I want to be? These are the type of questions you should constantly be exploring. The, the way um, I would do this, uh, and I'll come back to this in terms of some apps that you can kind of use and also just things on your computer that you can use to, to help with this. Um, you know, if, if you just uh, go on the, the VISP website, for example, and you find out, okay, there's these uh, open calls coming up just stick them into your diary or into your calendar and they become that action plan, you know, or the beginnings of that action plan. So it can be just as simple as getting dates in your diary uh, as to uh, when different applications uh, are coming up. I mean, in Norway, everybody's very aware of the MBCO uh, stipend deadlines and that's something that goes into everybody's diary and just kind of automatically know that you're going to be applying at that time of year. Uh, but that's something that can kind of be plotted out. And remember, with with uh, rejection, uh, it sounds kind of a little bit um, uh, facile or, or kitchen away. But you know, for every rejection, there's a whole ton of opportunities that open up because it means you're not doing that thing. There's been many times where I've been shortlisted for major public commissions and gone through like the concept development and model building and everything, then I haven't got them. And then afterwards, I've actually thought, well, um, that would have been two years working on that particular project. And maybe I didn't actually want to do it and all the other things that I did do. 
uh, in the meantime were were just as valuable if not more valuable so be kind of pragmatic and uh, uh, a bit philosophical about about these things as well <clears throat> as you plan ahead be open and aware of opportunities that may arise along the way but decisions should be aligned to the goals and objectives you set for your career take some time to analyze every opportunity that presents itself be selective not every offer is legitimate or worth your time effort and money remember it's okay to turn things down and to do so from a critical and informed perspective and some of the tools i'll be showing you to today um, will kind of give you the opportunity to maybe make some of those critical and informed uh, decisions but don't feel you have to say yes to everything because that um, uh, can be will will definitely affect your brand because not every opportunity is a good opportunity um, but it also is if, if you have a lot of offers and it starts to snowball it just becomes uh, untenable as well so so try and be be selective and have have a kind of idea of um, what uh, what you would say no to so um, some of the this talk uh, will be uh, just because I, I don't know <laughs> the audience and I don't want to kind of um, sort of uh, say stuff that uh, is, is if everybody should know uh, certain things. So I'm going to have to go into uh, pricing of artwork uh, in this talk because it's quite a relevant um, uh, topic. But one thing I won't be going into is portfolio presentation. Some of the things I'll be um, touching on regarding websites and so on, we'll touch on um, that. But if you would like to um, access a previous talk I did at Bergen Assembly, I can put this uh, link here in the chat. And it was a, a talk uh, I did uh, about um, uh, putting together a portfolio uh, of your work for, for open call applications and for other, other things. Um, uh, but the, the one thing that is, uh, I go into a little bit more detail, so I'm going to skim over this a little bit, but it's important to, um, to talk about it is pricing your work. So this is uh, the science uh, and art of pricing and costing your work. Um, so costing and pricing are two separate but interrelated. Uh, well, I should just say why, why I'm saying this. The, the in terms of pricing uh, an artist's work of course this can uh, like Christina was mentioning um, if you're working with a commercial gallery these would be the type of conversations that you would be having with your gallery but if you're working alone uh, first and starting out alone then you need to have some sort of parameters in terms of how to to price your work also it's not something that just stays static it's something that uh, develops over time and you need to have a system especially if you're not working with a gallery, a system by which you can establish, okay, when is the next time for my price marker to go up uh, based on the developments of my career? Um, and I'm just gonna give a few um, uh, kind of examples of how to, to go about this. Um, the costing and pricing are, is quite a complex thing. Um, uh, and I won't be able to go into it in detail, I'll go into a little bit more detail in the, uh, in the other talk, uh, but there's a lot of resources that I can point you to, uh, both online. Uh, very often, the um, uh, artists' uh, associations nationally in the country that you're, you're working from will have a lot of uh, this material, or you can find it in other uh, uh, artists' association websites as well. Um, and some of the things I'll be pointing to, like consignment agreements later on, uh, we'll touch on that. But um, you need to uh, focus on finding the right price for the work, but it can't be done in the absence of knowing how much it costs to make. Um, so you could, <clears throat> for example, if your work takes a really long time to, to make and involves very, very expensive materials, you could make the decision that you price it at uh, the value that it uh, uh, should be like at a very very high value based on costing and pricing it uh, but it it that's a decision that you're taking then uh, which may mean that you don't sell it uh, but of course you um, shouldn't undersell yourself either so it's 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 very often a, a balance with these things especially as an emerging artist and, and a developing artist um, uh, the um, in terms of costing what you need 
to do is you need to cost your practice, you cost your time, and you cost uh, your uh, project. Um, costing your time. So there's no fixed rates for your uh, working as an artist. Some artists benchmark their working time against uh, uh, national uh, rates or, or rates for paying of uh, teaching staff. Others establish a random figure in relation to the duration of the piece of work and the price that they think they can charge for a uh, finished piece. Um, there, neither of them are useful unless it relates to an actual cost of your time. Uh, so if you're a digital artist whose overheads are a laptop or broadband connection and electricity, your expenses might be uh, considerably less, although they could be more depending on your, on your practice as a digital artist. Um, but you might have a higher uh, uh, price of your practice if you need a large workshop space uh, in order to make three-dimensional work. So you need to relate the cost of your time in relation to your, uh, your overheads. Um, so you need to itemize your annual overheads of your practice, itemize your personal expenses, and then itemize the actual number of days that you're available to work. So, so this is an example of it. So your annual expenses are 20,000 euro. My personal expenses are 10,000 euro. So that means your total expenses are 30,000 euro. And then you have 200 working days a year. So you divide that 30,000 by 200. So your minimum working fee per day, which is, is this is very low. Uh, should be uh, 150, but then it's the break-even figure. So then you need to add on top of this. And it may be that you get, say you're doing um, a workshop in a primary school, you may get paid at one fee, uh, and then you're teaching at a university, you might get paid at a different fee. And all of these things can be factored into uh, establishing a holistic system for, for your art practice. Um, and then pricing your work is, uh, this is where it kind of relates to your brand because your brand becomes a component of how you price your work. So you have to establish your practice costs. You have, you've established your break-even point. You've established your project costs, and then you add them all together, add a contingency figure of 10%, a profit margin of another 10%, and add 100% for commission to gallery or agent, and then there's your price. Now, I've got a simpler version of how to do this, uh, so bear with me. Um, so the, how do you measure quality? How do you measure value? This is where it gets a bit complicated, and this is also where it relates to a, a brand. How do you know what people will pay to collect your work? And uh, also that is related to what I was talking about before, is like how your brand develops and how as you get more successful and sell more work, um, more people want to buy your work, then the value begins to go up. So there's fact factors that need to be taken into consideration apart from the break-even figure, and they are originality, quality, uniqueness, costs incurred, your break-even point, your reputation, your objective in making the work, and whether it's a one-off or multiples. So um, in, in this talk, I'm going to mention a few books. And again, with these books, you need to maybe take them a little bit at face value. Uh, this book is quite good. It's actually based on a PhD text by this guy, Magnus Reich. Um, but I, I'm very critical of this book. But I've, I've used some aspects of it, but I would read it very, very critically when you read it. But it's, it's interesting. Um, uh, and there are some uh, kind of key points. He basically does it from a, a data-driven uh, angle. So it's very much about uh, gathering market data and then building that uh, or building his argument out of that market data. This book, uh, I feel, is a bit better. It's much more geared to the American context, uh, but you can quite easily transfer it across to a European context. Um, and uh, it's maybe a little bit more comprehensive than the other book, so it's a little bit less. It's more like a, a book that you, a reference manual in a way, um, whereas the other book, you could actually kind of read it from cover to cover. It's more of a kind of coffee table book, but you can use it as a, a bit of a reference manual as well. Um, and now I've got a few other art, uh, artworks, art books as well. And I think what you need to do is you need to find the one or ones that fit what you need, you know, um, because every artist is different. Like I said, you're creating your own uh, world, your own space, and you're the expert within that world. But it, it will really very much depend. The, all these books are written in different ways. 
um, and for different artists. So, um, you know, uh, I'll, I'll try and put together, um, like, well, actually this uh, lecture is being recorded, but I'll try and also put together maybe a, a fact sheet with uh, a list of all the books as well that I can give um, to uh, Christina and, um, and Veronica to pass on to people that are interested or put on the website. Okay, so this is from the Magnus Reich book, uh, How to Price Your Artworks. Um, so he goes into time spent in production, size, motif. So it's pretty much uh, the same as what I was talking about before. But then he has this quite strange uh, 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 kind of uh, grid of how to price it. And it's a little bit strange, like, you know, what is small um, and junior and senior. So it's, it's interesting because if you look at it in relation to some of the other things I'm going to talk about in a second, uh, it does uh, fit uh, in some ways, but um, that's what I also think is important is not to take one book as the kind of gospel. It's important to kind of look at this holistic field of, of artist uh, career reference books as, um, as a field to investigate and then draw your own conclusions based on your own practice. So you, you, this is where it comes back to the um, uh, thing at the start with, with branding, researching your practice and uh, uh, researching your market. And this will depend on your area of practice. But I mean, I personally wouldn't take the point of view that it's a good idea to research your market and then make your work. You should be making your work and then after a period of time, figure out where your work fits in with a, a particular market. Um, the, it's very much important to maintain price integrity, and that's something that is very key within branding as well. Um, a buyer should not purchase a piece and find out a month later that your prices have gone down or they could have bought your work elsewhere at a cheaper price. So you also need to be really careful of exchange rates as well. You know, so if you're sell selling work in New York, selling work in uh, Berlin, um, they, of course, there can be a little bit of variability and that also uh, due to the exchange rates at the time, but it shouldn't be uh, extreme. They should be able to see, okay, that's because of the tax and that's because of this and that and so on, but you shouldn't have a, a big, um, there should be a, a price integrity. Uh, the reputation as artist is going to be a key and that's how much you can charge for your work. Um, so here is the factor system. This is what I use. And this is based on, um, I think it was a German gallerist that in, invented it uh, uh, maybe back in the 70s or 80s. Um, and it's quite a, a simple system. Um, what you do is you um, uh, take the height of an artwork and you add it to the width of an artwork in centimeters. Uh, and then you multiply it by a number, which is called the factor. And that, that gives you the price of the artwork in Euro. Uh, the factor is something that you uh, come to, if you're working with a gallerist, you can uh, establish that with a gallerist, but you can also work at it in reverse. Um, so if you're selling work already and you want to find out what your factor is, you just do the reverse. So you take the 3000 Euro um, and you divide it by, if it's a 100 by 100 painting, you divide it by 200, and then you find out that um, you're factor 15. Uh, and that would probably, factor 15 would probably be a reasonable uh, price, also going by the Magnus Reich book and other books, and so probably be a reasonable price for uh, an artist that has already done their uh, master's uh, or has, has graduated from the master's and maybe is one year out of the master's, but it's all relative. It depends on when, uh, uh, where you're selling your work and so on and so forth. The factor is then determined by the stage in an art career and goes up in relation to career development. So if you would have a major museum show, that could be a reason um, to put your factor up. And if you're working with a gallery, then that's a, a kind of career decision that you do in relation uh, with your with your gallery. It also becomes an opportunity for the gallery, say it's in advance of a, a solo show or after the opening of a solo show, they can work with their clients and they say, listen, you've bought this artist's work before, uh, uh, earlier on in the career, you've been supporting them, they've got this show coming up and uh, uh, they're, um, 
factor is going to go up uh, the, on the opening night, uh, would you like to buy uh, some of the work at the previous factor? Uh, so it's a kind of almost like a, not having a, a, a discount because normally there would be discounts, but also showing a collector that the value of the artwork is going up, which is uh, very often will make them feel happy, but then also uh, selling them to it at, at the, the full price. So there's kind of strategic um, ways of working with, with uh, uh, how uh, an artist's prices go up as well. Um, factor system can be used for uh, sculpture and installation and you just add an extra dimension uh, depth to the formula and then for video animation you can also come up with a system based on duration. Uh, it can also be adjusted to suit additions and drawings and works on paper so you just reduce the, the, the factor number based on works on paper or, or additions. Okay and then this is uh, also from that Magnus Reich book. So he talks about, this is where sort of the market research comes in. A uh, majority of online buyers spend less than $5,000 annually in art galleries. The average price for contemporary artwork in 2018 was $9,335. If you're selling your work straight from your studio, then buyers may expect it to be half the price that they would be quoted in the galleries. But this is a really problematic thing because if you start doing that, then this may be okay at the beginning of your career, but also you're kind of under underselling yourself. And then it's uh, also um, uh, what happens when you start uh, showing galleries, but maybe it's okay for, maybe he's referring just at the beginning of, of the career, not throughout uh, an artist's career. Uh, if you're working with a commercial gallery, you should never uh, uh, sell um, the work at a 50% discount directly to uh, a collector and uh, also, the, uh, I'll go into it also about working with commercial galleries uh, in the, a little bit later in the talk. Um, at auction, 92% uh, of the works are priced below 50,000 and 70% are priced under 5,000. So people often hear about huge auction prices and those are uh, not necessarily uh, true to the way auctions work within especially a, an emerging artist's career. Um, very early on in your career if your work starts going to auction that's normally a bad thing um, because it will uh, normally achieve there's exceptions to the rule of course but it will normally achieve a much lesser price than what is the gallery price and that can be very confusing for collectors who are buying uh, works from um, from a, a, a higher price from the gallery but what they should understand is that those works that are available are few and far between and it can easily slip the other way over time so that the works can um, increase in value, like say, for example, somebody like P Peter Doig, where the work becomes much, much more expensive uh, at auction than it would be buying it um, at the gallery, but that also drives up the prices at the gallery. Uh, these are two uh, big collectors in uh, New York, the, the Horts, and they say, an artist who graduated, who isn't making their best work yet, I don't know really what that means, <laughs> uh, but um, should ask for $6,000 to $7,000 or less per piece to start slow. So that is roughly around what I'm talking about in relation to the uh, factor as well. It's a little bit higher, but that might be to do with the American market as well, because uh, the European uh, emerging art market tends to be especially in Germany and so on, tends to be, um, works tend to be uh, valued a little bit less than stay, say in the States. He's also got all these diagrams in this uh, book, um, uh, which you're very welcome to kind of uh, look into. Um, I, I, I'm not sure how useful they are, but uh, they're kind of interesting uh, in a sort of nerdy sort of way to sort of see what, uh, what the market, share of um, art buyers. Uh, so it's interesting to see that there's so many people in this um, rookie uh, set, but uh, that that's a very small percentage of, um, uh, of the actual value of, of uh, the work, even though it's a, it's a huge chunk of what uh, of the people that are buying. Then he also goes into uh, trading levels and players in the market, uh, these different kind of uh, connections. And this is what I was just talking about. The secondary market is here, and that's the auctions. Um, uh, so 
uh, auction houses, uh, but it's intersecting with the uh, the primary markets and this uh, uh, central part here as well. Okay, so uh, working with commercial galleries, selecting, approaching, and being approached. Um, this is also from his uh, book, and he uh, categorizes galleries as alpha, beta, gamma, and delta galleries. Um, uh, again, I don't know if this is useful, but it is maybe useful to understand that there are different levels of galleries. You know, what we're talking about at the alpha level is uh, galleries like Pace, um, Gagosian, David Zwerner, these, these really big galleries, Brian Goodman. And then the beta galleries are the level below, and then this gamma and delta. So it's like this kind of uh, pyramid. And I'll talk about how also ga as galleries get ranked, also artists get ranked. So most, most commercial galleries are the brainchild of one or two people and are founded for the most part by people who are interested in contemporary art or have a background in the visual arts from college or university. Most galleries are a business of passion and are run by somebody who's very passionate about the arts, who's often driven by personal agendas. Even though dependent on sales to survive, the galleries tread a fine line between existence that is also defined by a critical context based on who they show and why. The reputation of the gallery is based on the success and content of its exhibition program, and the galleries are hugely conscious of the responses to each show, both critically and financially. Now, you can also have an artist-run gallery that then uh, turns into a more commercial gallery over time, or an artist-run gallery that um, right at the offset, decided to have a commercial aspect. I was involved with an artist-run gallery in England many years ago, and we took a group of artists to the Zoo Art Fair. Um, but it was a very, um, it was very successful at the time. But it wasn't a, sort of a long-term uh, project that me and, and four others were doing. But it's very often that uh, commercial galleries can, or not very often, but sometimes commercial galleries can grow out of. Um, of an artist run context as well. Uh, but it's important to understand commercial galleries versus public museum uh, spaces or museums. So unlike public spaces and museums, commercial galleries represent artists and these relationships form ongoing financial and creative working arrangements. These relationships vary in detail, but broadly follow an established pattern of expectations and commitments from both sides. Public spaces and museums might hold solo and group exhibitions like commercial galleries, but generally they do not have ongoing relationships with an artist in the same way. They do not, for the most part, sell art, but receive public grants to allow them to hold exhibitions. And that would mean that you would uh, normally, uh, for example, in Norway, get a fee for doing uh, an exhibition at a public space, but you definitely don't get a fee for doing an exhibition at a commercial gallery. Um, Commercial galleries do not receive public money. They may do sometimes for uh, art fairs from like culture grants and so on to maybe take work to art fairs, say in, in New York or elsewhere to promote the culture from that particular country. But it's very rare that they get uh, public money and they rely on sales to keep trading. Public spaces do not attend art fairs. Some of them do, um, but art fairs form a significant, significant part of how commercial gallery trades. It's also an opportunity for commercial galleries to network, and uh, that's also how artists get represented by other galleries. Being represented by a commercial gallery, representation by a commercial gallery is based on the principle that the artist makes the work for the exhibition and the gallery sells the work. The commission taken as a standard is 50%, 50%, uh, so 50% goes to the artist and 50% to the gallery. Um, but uh, However, relationships are by circumstance much more complex. Using the 50% commission, galleries pay for the gallery space, the gallery staff, private view, invitations, and promotion of the exhibition to the press. Artists make and fabricate the work to cover their own studio costs as well as material costs. As a rule of thumb, artists should never pay a higher fee to a gallery, and any suggestion that they do that is simply wrong. So if you get, this is one of the reasons why you should say no to something. If you get approached by um, say a gallery in New York, and then uh, into the further down in the email, it says there's a two thousand dollar rental fee. Then just say no or don't even reply to that email. Um, it's the same if there's um, a different uh, uh, exhibitions, say in Venice or so on, and then you read the small print and you find out actually there's a there's a huge um, 
participation fee uh, that the um, that you have to pay for because the the uh, the money is uh, that uh, the gallery is is um, making is is from uh, the fifty percent share. So there shouldn't be any more money on on top of that. Um, if an artist wishes to have a serious ongoing working relationship with the gallery, then 50% split of sales rooms should always be used, whatever the circumstances, with discounts offered to collectors by the gallery or any other reason the artist should never receive less than 50% of the final sale after tax and that has been accounted for. Discounts are usually taken off the top of the sale before the 50% 50, 50 division is applied. So you could, with your gallery, decide to give a 10 percent commission to a particular collector maybe because they're buying several works or they've been collectors have been buying for a number of, of years um but you that doesn't mean that the the gallery gets six it gets uh 40 or you get less than the gallery it, it should be uh, still 50 50 whatever happens and if those um decisions have been made then uh, I'll come to that in a second with uh, with a consignment agreement, which is your kind of protection, both a protection for the gallery and protection for the artist. But it's it's um, it is a contract, but it's not like a, a an artist contract, uh, artist gallery contract, which is a much more complex thing. Um, so uh, this is what can can happen here, where. Uh, if you're working with a gallery that is representing you as your main gallery. So uh, you get 50%, 50%, like I said, but then um, you maybe are approached by, a, say, an art fair or something to have uh, a solo show with another commercial gallery. Uh, say this is your main gallery is in New York, and then a gallery in Berlin is over in New York at an art fair. They uh, like your work. They want to show you. Then as a kind of um, gesture, this is the way it uh, can work. It's not always going to be this case, but it can work that the main gallery uh, will get 10% of the commission, the other gallery will get 40%, and the artist still gets 50% um, of the commission. Um, then this is another uh, model here, which I don't entirely agree with, uh, but it can also be uh, used in practice. Uh, where the main gallery gets 20% from a, a group exhibition uh, in another gallery in the world, and the artist gets 50% and the other gallery gets 30%. Um, of course, if you don't have a main gallery, then probably what you will be working with is having a gallery, say if you have, are lucky to have a gallery in America, a gallery in Europe, uh, or maybe two galleries in Europe, then you're going based on the countries where that uh, those galleries are trading. And of course, those galleries might be um, in contact with each other or not, depending on how uh, the arrangements have set up. And there's pros and cons for both situations because with a main gallery, if you're working with a really good main gallery that is on top of everything, then they'll be, they'll be dealing with a lot of these things that uh, give you more time to spend in the studio. But um, uh, of course, it can get complicated with other galleries that if they don't want to pay this commission um, and the main gallery wants it, or maybe the main gallery doesn't want you to show in another gallery and you want to show in the other gallery. So there's lots of examples of these different things. But again, this is about you having control of your brand and being able to be in a position of uh, making the demands that you want to, to make as an artist uh, and, and as an entrepreneur in your own right. Um, just uh, this is a lot of text here, but I'll just point out that it's worth pointing out the artists represented by this NYC gallery do not have solo shows in other galleries in NYC unless they're non commercial galleries such as museum or public spaces. So it would be very strange for you and, and a bit of a conflict if you have your main gallery or a gallery in New York and then you suddenly turn around and have a solo show in another gallery in New York, especially if you're not talking to your gallery about it. That's just a kind of crazy thing to do unless you want to leave that particular gallery. So there's there's a kind of etiquette to the artist gallery relationship. And as I mentioned earlier on in the text, this is a normally a long term commitment between the artist and the gallery. Uh, this is also from that book. You should familiarize yourself with the international gallery landscape, research their programs, visit the galleries and get to know the art, artists who show there. 
Um, this is what he says is do's and don'ts, uh, research and know the gallery. Um, this is in terms of like contacting or trying to work with, with a gallery. Uh, be patient, be prepared, keep your website and Instagram updated, go to events and show interest, keep in touch with your artistic community, ask questions regarding past experiences, revenue numbers and payment. So that would be if you're talking to like other artists uh, to know that this is a good gallery to work with and so on. Um, don't uh, approach galleries at art fairs or send unsolicited portfolios. You'll often see on a, a gallery website, it says we do not accept or return any unsolicited portfolios. So that usually means that they're not interested uh, in you sending them um, information about your artwork, but you, you could send them invites to exhibitions and, uh, and sometimes it does work to send unsolicited portfolios, but just don't expect uh, a reply because you, it's, it's kind of a shot in the dark and definitely have done your research beforehand because there's no point in sort of blanket um, applying to, to various galleries because, um, you know, if you haven't actually looked into what the gallery is showing and whether it's a good fit for you, then it also could, even if, if it comes off, it's not necessarily a good idea. Um, so this is uh, from an, another uh, a gallerist who said this is like galleries find artists through a number of ways through other artists. Most galleries listen to what existing artists think and are building mutually supportive stable of artists. Degree shows, uh, selected shows, group exhibitions and through the press. And then this is another quote, if an artist approaches me for an exhibition, but I've never seen them in the gallery before, that's a no. If someone comes to openings and becomes a familiar face, then I appreciate their interest and consider their offer more seriously. So if it's, it's about kind of being part of the milieu, a part of the scene and uh, getting in, in contact with people. Do your homework when looking for representation. If you are eyeing a specific gallery, make sure your work fits in with that gallery's program. Talk to the other artists and make sure they are financially secure enough to take on another artist. So then this is uh, uh, the artist gallery consignment agreement. And this uh, is from the Danish, it's on the Danish um, Artists Association website in English. Um, and it's quite a good consignment agreement to use as a, as a template. And it's very important, not only to protect your brand, but to protect uh, yourself as an artist in terms of, uh, your artworks uh, and what the the rules around the artworks are, um, because that uh, kind of creates the parameters for what the gallery can do and cannot do, and it also makes very things very clear between you and the gallery. And this is a a document that the gallery can draw up, um, uh, and some of the really good galleries will do up very good consignment agreements, and it's just a matter of you know looking at them together maybe get an expert opinion about it if the gallery's written up the consignment agreement. But say if you're showing with a gallery in Denmark, then it would be entirely valid to bring along this uh, consignment template to the gallery. And um, you're basically going into the same details that I was mentioning before about um, the 50-50 cut. Um, if there's a reduction of uh, a discount of up to 10% and you, the gallery doesn't inform the artist, then the gallery has to pay that extra. Uh, so it's, so if, uh, if you've agreed 10%, but then they give 20%, then that extra 10% comes from the, the gallery because uh, that wasn't something that has been checked with you unless they check with you over the phone and you say it's okay. Um, then there's things like reprodu reproducing the uh, images. You don't have to put that in there, but uh, it's, uh, I guess nice to put it in there because it means it, it's, it's all kind of above board that they can produce the images on the website without paying an extra fee and so on. This number six uh, is important because um, if the gallery uh, enters into an agreement uh, with uh, a buyer, for example, for a commission or something, um, then they will be, the gallery will be liable for those agreements because, you know, you as an artist haven't uh, entered into that agreement so you can kind of say no I didn't say you could do that and I don't want to to paint that uh, 60 foot bird on that that building um, and then the gallery has to sort it out because they should always check with you in, in advance um, this is also important uh, galleries should be responsible for safekeeping of the artworks ensuring against uh, 
damage and loss. Um, the works are exhibited outside the gallery, the packing and shipping, also the transportation to the client. You know, you shouldn't get a bill at the end of it all, which uh, means that you're actually making less money. You should always get the, this 50%. Um, also the shipment uh, should be above board. Sometimes it is quite often in, in Norway with even with public institutions that the artist pays one way of the transport. But that's not always the case uh, uh, internationally. Uh, so you just need to be kind of clear, you know, who's responsible for the transportation, if it's one way or if it's uh, the gallery is responsible for both ways. Um, and yeah, this is a really important document for uh, protecting, uh, protecting yourself. Um, maybe, let's see, well, here's an example of uh, uh, consign another part of a consignment agreement. Um, it doesn't have the prices on here, but you would, so you would also have the prices on. But um, you would have uh, the cover page of this previous document here. So that would be one page A4. I've just made it bigger uh, so that it goes across two pages so you can see it. But you would have that at the beginning. Then you would have um, numbered pages, uh, like say, if there's five pages of artworks, one to five, and each page should be signed. Also, um, documentation in images should be um, on the um, on the document as well, because then it's clear which artwork uh, is being uh, consigned to the gallery. Okay, maybe I can have a look at the chats a little bit here. Um, yeah, that's okay. So I think we're. We're good. Okay, so the next bit here I'm going on to is using uh, available online resources, um, Artifacts, Artsy, Artnet, Limna, Artprice, Artland, and Artfair websites. So um, in this book, um, uh, the Magnus Reich, he also splits up uh, artists into <laughs> these terms, which I don't really agree with, but it's kind of interesting to see how uh, somebody uh, thinks of these things. So you have superstars, mature emerging, main street artists, vanity artists, and passion artists. I really don't understand why he's kind of term, termed them this way, but he explains each of them in, uh, in detail in the book. He also uh, talks about this kind of career progression of different types of artists, and again, you know, maybe his market data and uh, uh, data analysis from his PhD kind of backs this up. Uh, but I still feel that there's um, uh, a lot of exceptions to the rule, and especially at the moment. Um, I mean, his, his book's a little bit, uh, even though it's very new, it's a little bit out of date already with what's happened in terms of NFTs, uh, what's happened with um, the artist support pledge, which I'll go into in a bit later. Um, it's also very um, out of date in relation to the current documenta, which is this very big focus on um, uh, uh, collectives and collaborative practice. Um, and uh, also the Turner Prize run by, uh, or uh, uh, won by a collective, um, the Array Collective. Um, but this is what he suggests is that um, in your sort of, uh, 40s up to your 50s you're in this kind of de decision phase where you're represented uh, by a few different galleries uh, but not in the top two groups uh, and you're using side jobs to fund the artwork but that the idea is that you should be moving up to um, the alpha or beta gallery at, at this point um, and then also this kind of final phase stardom for a small fraction majority of part-time full-time position to fund artwork. Uh, but, you know, it doesn't take into account people like Etel Adan, uh, Louise Bourgeois, you know, many great artists who uh, uh, kind of uh, ma matured into their career um, later on in their life. And um, uh, so I, I, I would take all of these things with a pinch of salt, but it's interesting to, to look into. Um, this uh, is uh, something that's, again, to be taken with a pinch of salt, but it's something that um, I think can be used by artists. And again, this is kind of uh, going into maybe taking a bit of agency 
uh, over from some of these online um, uh, online uh, resources. So for the last 20 years, this website, artfacts.net, has been collating data about the, the art world. Uh, and it started out essentially as an artist ranking website. So based on um, an uh, the artist's exhibition profile, the type of galleries they're showing in, um, whether they're public institutions or commercial galleries, whether they're like very high level galleries or lower level galleries, uh, an artist uh, ranking uh, is established and then it improves, it increases or decreases depending on um, what they're uh, doing and what shows they're having. Now it's kind of ridiculous in a way because you have people like Caravaggio on there and uh, uh, Bellini, other uh, fantastic Renaissance artists and their ranking is very, very low because it's very much based on activity and uh, exhibiting um, the exhibitions that are going on at the moment or a year by year basis. Um, but here's an example. So you have Hugo Rondion, who's a Swiss artist. Uh, at the time when I put this together, he was ranked number 92 um, and uh, globally and number six in Switzerland. And that's over a 30 year career. It's trajected. The same with uh, Pipilotti Risk, uh, Rist, who's ranked number 44 and that number nine in, uh, in Switzerland. Then the other thing that they've done um, relatively recently uh, is uh, they've started ranking, I think maybe it was in the last four or five years or so, they've started ranking uh, galleries. And this is something that's interesting, I think, for artists. Uh, so it can be used as a resource to establish, again, taking it with a pinch of salt, establish whether a gallery is uh, on a higher level or a lower level, and also uh, I guess it can be used as a resource for uh, finding out what galleries are in a particular uh, country at a particular time. The trouble is it's a massive database um, that they're using and it relies also on a lot of um, kind of user participation in that people, the galleries themselves keep these uh, things up to date um, and also artists themselves keeps things up to date, which means there's a lot of things out of date. But in terms of maintaining your own brand if you really want to maintain your brand and if you think that people take this seriously and i know some curators and gallerists do take this seriously others think it's absolutely ridiculous um, but it's something that's growing more and more especially with algorithms and um, uh, with uh, the, this kind of data uh, ai and so on uh, artificial intelligence or artificial learning uh, so these are a few more examples um, the top 10 stars of tomorrow and today. So you've got George Bazelitz, Sean Scully, Dennis Brary. So they're ranked, he's ranked uh, 88 globally, five in Switzerland. And this is something you can kind of look into. Um, it's uh, part of it's behind a firewall. Uh, you can sign up as, as an artist, I think for free, uh, but then there's some of the stuff that uh, to get access to it is behind this kind of firewall, but you generally get like, whether somebody's in the top 100 or in the top 10,000 and so on. So this is what it looks like uh, when you go online. So you have David Zwerner Gallery, uh, it's ranked number four global, number three in the United States. Then you have uh, all the artists uh, that are showing with the gallery. You also have a breakdown of artists by gender, artists by age, so you get kind of an idea of, of what the spread of what uh, the gallery is working with. You also then can, uh, behind the firewall thing, you can actually um, uh, get a, an order of ranking uh, from the all the artists that are represented by the gallery and see, you know, like Wolfgang Tillmans and Thomas Roof and Sigmar Polka, they're all in the top 100. Um, and then you also get a, an overview of past shows. Then another thing you can do is, uh, uh, and again, this is only for the people that are interested in this type of stuff. Um, uh, I don't particularly use this, but it's something that I feel that it's important to, to know about and to keep update, uh, updated. Um, they also have a, a breakdown country by country and also city by city. So you can actually, see um, all the different galleries in a particular city. So 
going back to what I was talking about earlier um, with uh, uh, deciding if a gallery is a good gallery to work with, say if they approach you or uh, they, uh, or if you're interested in approaching them, then this is maybe a quick way of beginning to get an overview of where the gallery st stands in terms of the global context, also within the local context, and then also whether they're good, uh, you know, as part of your kind of research uh, policy. Of course, going onto the gallery website is the best way to find out a lot of this information as well, and that's totally free. Then this is what it looks like for an artist. So Andy Warhol is still at number one, and uh, you get all this, this data. And then this is a, an artist, uh, uh, she's put uh, the information on her own website and she's ranked, or at the time of when she put this on her website, uh, she was ranked around 3000 globally. Um, and this is the breakdown that she's been able to extract from the, the uh, behind the firewall information. So basically, if you've ever had an exhibition that's been uh, or exhibitions that have been put into this database, you will have a profile on this. Uh, as an artist, you will have a profile on this uh, this website, uh, and uh, you you can also update that for free. But they just uh, take longer to update it. But you just simply send them an email saying this exhibition is missing. Can you please update it? And that will affect uh, your ranking uh, as well. So. Oops, uh, and then it does it by, uh, so the previous one was like solo shows, art fairs, group shows and biennales. And you can see when she had these biennales here, uh, this is when it sort of went up. So it's quite simple, you know, uh, several biennales in a row and her art ranking goes way up. Then uh, this is all based on museums, art fairs. Uh, and seeing how many uh, uh, in different places. It also gives a breakdown of where the exhibitions are taking place. So you can see she has a kind of spread of um, uh, many exhibitions globally, but most of them are taking place in Europe. Then connected, a relatively recent thing is uh, connected to this, uh, and this is where it gets a little bit worrying and I don't know, kind of ridiculous as well, but it's something that I think in terms of an artist brand and uh, talk about an artist brand, it's important to um, uh, go into this and to discuss this and for us to know as artists to know about and have uh, some sort of opinion about and, and uh, sort of do stuff about um, is that there's this other website. Uh, it's actually an app for only for Apple for the moment, um, for iPhone and, and iPads. Um, and it's a program called Limna or an app called Limna. And it's connected not just to Artifacts, but it's a subsidiary of Artifacts. And it's connected to um, also to social media. And it basically takes the, the data of uh, artists' momentum based on those factors. And then it looks at the gallery price um, in. Uh, like what they, uh, and it's not perfect yet, but it's, it's, I think it'll probably get there eventually, but it looks at the actual uh, price in the gallery. And then it goes with the estimated price of what it should be. So for example, if you're a collector, uh, you could use this app and that's what they're sort of promoting is that you can actually use this app to uh, speculate on the, the art market and get good deals early on in an artist's career. So it's the AI powered art advisor in your pocket. Um, so I think as artists, we need to be aware of these types of things coming up because there's more and more of these things coming and also to take a little bit of um, agency and, and uh, uh, power back in, in this. And maybe we can discuss some ways of doing that at, at the end of the talk. Um, so you have these different galleries saying it's fantastic and um, it's great for collectors and amateurs alike and so on and so forth. It's a bit like uh, top trumps or something for, for artists. Um, so you have, uh, similar to the Artifacts website, you have this cultural recognition, global presence, art fair presence, and career length. And then that's Andy Warhol. So you can see he's like 100, close to 100. And, and that's why he's number one in the, in the world. Uh, so it's, it's a very strange thing, but it's something that is, is happening. There's like other, other examples similar to it as well. Um, so this is 
the kind of how it works online uh, or when you when you type in an artist's name into the app. Uh, so this is Remus van der Velde and um, you put in the, the height of a painting, uh, if you see it in a gallery, and then you sort of say it's that price, and then the app tells you if it's good value. Uh, it's kind of a way of checking if, uh, if the price is right, and then you can call the gallery and uh, make your purchase. Okay, so um, how are we doing? Yeah, everybody out there, I'm kind of talking into the, the screen. Um, we've got another uh, 40 minutes. Uh, to go. Um, uh, is it all making okay sense, Christina? Yes, definitely. <laughs> That's good. I just wanted to uh, ask you if you would like to have a five minute break also because you were yeah, talking and maybe we can just have a, a super short. Yeah, that would be good. I think that would yeah? be really good. Okay. So let's take then, um Yes, five minute break, everyone, and, and we'll meet here at, uh, yeah. 26 past. Perfect. See you yeah. in a second. Thanks.
back again. Yes, I think we can start. Oh, okay. People are just coming back, but perfect. Well, maybe I can take um, a couple of the questions in the in the chat. So, um, Adam has asked, "What is an art fair compared to commercial gallery and public museum? What is the artist's relation to them?" So, an art fair is um, uh, an, uh, normally another organization that it could be set up by a group of galleries, uh, but it uh, is normally a kind of independent organization. Um, so you've got uh, the longest running art fair is Art Cologne, um, and then in a close second, it's, I think it's probably Art Basel, uh, which then sort of uh, went from Basel in Switzerland also over to Miami Beach and is now going to Paris. And they basically set up for uh, normally a three to four day period uh, uh, at particular times of the year once a year and uh, galleries can pay to participate. So galleries from all around the world, for example, come to Basel in June and they pay for a booth. So it involves vast sums of money to pay for these booths because it's based on the square meterage and it's kind of prime, uh, uh, prime spot in, in these, these major fairs. Uh, but they're very important for commercial, some commercial galleries uh, kind of financial well-being. And uh, it's also important for networking and, um, uh, and other things. Um, and then relate, compared to what you're asking, Adam, compared to commercial gallery, public museum, um, public museums will probably visit art fairs to purchase works because it's one place where you can actually buy uh, new works. So there will be public museum representatives at art fairs. Um, and then a commercial gallery, uh, commercial galleries show at the fair and then also commercial galleries who aren't in a particular fair may go to visit that fair to research other artists and so on. So it's very much a, a space where collectors, curators, other gallerists all come together. Um, the artist's relation to them is a little bit unusual <laughs> because um, they're very interesting uh, to go there, but they're not necessarily, like I said earlier on, it's not the place to necessarily approach galleries because if you imagine galleries are very busy with the, the job of selling the work at the fair and making contacts and networking and everything. And if an artist kind of comes up and uh, distracts them and all of that, uh, especially if it's an artist they've never met before and don't know who they are, it can be very um, off-putting for the, for the gallerist. But of course, uh, a gallerist might like to have um, artists who are represented in the gallery come to the fair and uh, be around and to talk with collectors and, and maybe make connections. I mean, different art fairs, I've got a lot of gallery shows and other contacts with uh, Kunsthalle and so on uh, out of different uh, art fair situations. Um, and then uh, Galena is saying uh, all of this, I think probably referring to the, uh, to the, the AI and um, art facts and things, all of this like mafioso criminal networking, where's the morality and integrity? None of the systems are promoting quality, only inviting for manipulation of the system. Yes, I agree. It's a, it's a very uh, strange uh, kind of way of ranking artists, ranking galleries, uh, also using uh, AI to figure out like the social media presence of artists and, and all of these different things. But unfortunately, um, the, well, fortunately, unfortunately, the art world is a very unregulated, probably one of the last unregulated uh, spaces in, uh, in, in the world. And uh, it has this uh, uh, possibility and problem. And I think uh, for us as artists, we need to be um, critical, but also see that we also have power in all of this and the agency with all of this and also to know about these things as they happen and maybe push back against them. And, and like I said as well, um, certain trends in the art world cut against these because, you know, uh, a Ray Collective winning the Turner Prize, so many artists run collectives being uh, represented at do Documenta now. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of things changing within the art world that don't, doesn't really fit into this uh, system, but it's something that's important to be aware of. Um, 
Christina, can you see any other uh, questions or should I just keep going? Uh, there is also a raised hand and an extra question in the chat. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe if we can take this, uh, the raised hand and then the question you can, even in the chat you can answer in the end. Yeah, sounds good. Um, just because I see there is a hand and then not to let it. <laughs> yeah, just in case it's, long. yeah. So uh, I, I think Alina Filica, if you can go ahead with the question. Well, no question. Alina says no question. Okay, okay, perfect. Yeah, so I'll continue with the, the talk and uh, just add in more questions if you if you have anything along the way and then we'll take them at the end. Great, so um, this next section is maintaining your brand, website and archiving of work. So I took a few um, case studies of artists' websites uh, just to kind of give people a bit of an overview. You can do this yourself, you know, to kind of go on to artists' websites that you like. Uh, and um, look into how they how they approach it. Um, David Shrigley has a website. I mean, there's differing opinions on this, whether you should have a website or not. I mean, if you're not represented by a gallery, I think it's a definite must to have a presence on there, but I think it's good for an artist to have a website, even if you are represented by a gallery. And I'll show some examples of artists. I mean, David Shrigley is an, an artist who's represented by many galleries and he still has his own website. Um, he actually has a shop uh, on his website. Um, I'm not sure I like that idea, uh, but it, I think it actually fits with his brand uh, to, to have a shop and it makes his work very kind of accessible. You can kind of go into these other links to things. It's also very democratic in a way. It's not for every artist. And, and I think also he must have arrangements with his commercial uh, galleries that he collaborates with so that uh, they have it all kind of um, set up in the right way. Then, uh, then he has his uh, different uh, bodies of artwork on there. Uh, this is his sculpture work. Uh, the previously was his painting work. Then these are his photographs. So it's a very clear, clean cut, but also uh, very much his aesthetic as well. This kind of clean but lo-fi uh, aesthetic, which works very well with his brand. Um, then Isaac Julian, uh, the video uh, artist, video and photography artist, he uh, has a website that is actually run by uh, or on the platform ArtLogic, which I'll be talking about because I use the same platform for my website, but his is a bespoke website. So he's basically hired ArtLogic to uh, make a special website based on what he wanted. Uh, so it's slightly different from their templates. I've just gone with a particular template that, that suited me. So um, you go into that uh, entry page and then you have artworks, exhibitions and news, publications um, and uh, information about him, all these different things. Uh, and you can see the aesthetic, aesthetic of this. So you have his studio details, which are, if we were on the website, we would be able to scroll down and see that and also the gallery contact details, which is very, very sort of standard as well. Then he also has uh, all the publications that he's uh, done and they're on the website as well. Um, again, very clear, clean. Uh, also the font is uh, uh, specifically designed and fits with his uh, brand. And uh, I think it's a, it's a very uh, easy to navigate website which represents his work very well. So this is uh, ArtLogic. Uh, which is a website and archive providing agency. It's a bit expensive, but um, one thing to say is like, if you're, if you're making work, you're selling work, or even if you're uh, not selling work, but doing other work to, in order to fund your art practice, uh, you know, if you're running a company for your artwork, you will always uh, either be running at a deficit or in profit. And uh, a lot of these different costs, um, can be written off on you know cost for a website or cost for uh, having access to software or apps whatever uh, can be written off uh, in terms of um, uh, the the expenses of your company so it's it's important also to um, 
carve out time for your practice because uh, one of the reasons why I went into um, uh, Art Logic and, and setting up a website there was that I was doing a, a sabbatical and um, I just was finding it completely crazy to keep uh, control and overview over my archive and I just um, felt I needed to get it all in order and it's been one of the best things I've done in the last um, five or 10 years is to get everything in order uh, in the archive. And I'll show you that in a minute. Um, so this is Ava Rothschild's uh, website. Again, very clear, representing her sculptures. You've got all her previous works here um, uh, done by, by year. Very clear website uh, with more works uh, here. And you can also click on the different dates up here to, to jump quickly to those particular periods. And it's, it's not quite a catalog resume, but, it's, but it is a very comprehensive website. Uh, then you have her sculpture commission. So, you know, if you were uh, uh, an institution that was interested in her work, you go on and see, oh, she does outdoor works. You know, the brand is being represented in a very holistic manner, um, maybe different to what you would see in a, even in a catalog or monograph or a, a, a definitely at an exhibition. But on the website, it gives this kind of um, great overview of, of uh, what she does. And then this was something that I hadn't realized that she does, but she also does design as well. So a little bit similar to, to David Shrigley, you know, we have these other objects that are maybe in additions or designed objects. And then she also represents that uh, on her website. Um, and the same would go for you if you were a singer songwriter and an artist, you know, you would need to decide, do you want to brand those two things together or brand them slightly separately, but have kind of links in social media and on your website between these different things. So anything's, anything's possible, but you need to set up the kind of real structure for your, your own work and your own aesthetic in terms of, of branding. Then you also have the publications here and very important to biography as well. And it's important to keep your website up to date. Also, you see from these images, very good quality documentation. Um, if you find it difficult to document your work, uh, you know, practice, get better at it. But if you still find it uh, that you, you're not happy with the quality of the documentation, then it's absolutely fine to work with uh, professional photographers and and just make sure that you get your work documented as you make it or when you have exhibitions. And then that also can be written off as expenses in your, uh, in your tax uh, reports at the end of the year as well. So it's definitely a good idea to invest in that. The same goes for working with things like uh, Photoshop. You know, if you're good at Photoshop, that's a real advantage to be able to prepare your your Photoshop and InDesign and other applications. But if, if you find that that's something that you don't want to do, then just make sure that you get other people to do it and then um, uh, take, take the, that into account in terms of expenses. Uh, this is Andrea Zittel's website. So it goes into her whole project in, in uh, California, A to Z West, which also has a residency program and um, uh, you see it's again a pretty clear website with uh, overview at the bottom instead of at the top with projects and text and biography contact and so on she's also got a shop as well so i would i would suggest you know if you're uh, updating your website or if you're redesigning it or if you're starting from scratch you know do do your research find out what the available resources are i've got a few listed at the end of the talk that i'll go through uh, some ones are free, like um, uh, uh, you know, different blogs and so on. But then also there's uh, some that, that cost a small amount and then others that cost more. Uh, then these are all the galleries that represent her, Sadie Coles, Regan Projects with Magus Lee and Gallery Massimo Di Carlo. Uh, this is Francis Alice's website. Um, uh, I think it's it's great, uh, his website, maybe not super uh, easy to navigate and so on, but one of the things that's great is that he seems to pretty much have all his, um, at least his video projects on there, and you can download them as MP4s, so it's an incredibly democratic way of working, uh, completely opposite to the, the sort of idea of um, selling um, uh, you know, uh, NFTs and so on, even though that's a democratic in a different way. Um, 
but to sort of be able to get access to this uh, overview is very, very generous. Mark Leckie does the same. So you just go onto YouTube and a lot of his works are on there, at least in um, excerpts or sometimes the whole thing. So uh, Isaac Julian does it a bit differently, but he what he does is um, he has multi-channel video installations. So it might be eight screen video installation, but then he does a, a four or three screen version and then he does a single channel version. So he re-edits them. And then that means from his side of things, of course, there's an economy around that. So of course a collector can buy an addition of the, the smaller scale version, um, but also um, it means that it's uh, also easier to show, for example, in a cinema context, um, or do screenings at, at, at other contexts rather than having to be set up as an installation all the time. This is the website of John Girard, an uh, Irish artist who works with new media. Um, it's a, again, very clear grid-like website. It's his list of um, exhibitions and I think they're linked in through, uh, it's his kind of bio is linked in through to the actual exhibition so you can click on them and, and enter them either through the exhibitions link or through this uh, going year by year. And then I just thought I'd put in this one, uh, Gerhard Richter has actually a catalog resume online. Um, and this is um, quite interesting because it's an overview of all the works uh, that he's ever done uh, documented on, on the website. And I think uh, for research, for posterity, uh, education, uh, also just uh, exposure for an artist. Uh, I think more and more uh, we as artists should be uh, thinking uh, of, of not necessarily having our catalog resume completely open and, and public and so on, but, but to definitely uh, document our, our work. And that's what I'm gonna talk about now. So you can go in and have a explore of, of that catalog resume to see what a catalog resume uh, looks like. And the catalog resume is basically uh, a catalog of every work that's ever been produced by, by an artist uh, and put together uh, in, in a comprehensive archive. Okay, so like I mentioned, uh, probably a couple of years ago now, I got to a point where I was getting very frustrated. I'd been working for about 25 years as an artist and I had all these folders on my computer. I had printouts, I had artworks in lots of different places uh, in Denmark and in Norway and all around the world. And I was beginning to lose an overview of everything. So I did some research, uh, looked into all these different websites uh, offering uh, services. So uh, this was the one I decided to go with, artlogic.net. And I'm just going to give you, um, I'm not going to go into all of them. I think you just I'll provide these links, but um, you, uh, of course can do it the way I was doing it, which is having like a good, like I say here, having a good set of Excel sheets um, with a combination of folders containing documentation of your work. But if you imagine this gets more and more um, logistically difficult over time, the more and more work you produce, especially if you're, you're quite prolific as an artist. Um, so I decided to go with ArtLogic, and this is what it looks like in ArtLogic. You, you go in, you've got, you have to input in all the data, but once you put it in there, you have, so I've got currently 729 records. Um, so that's my installations, my paintings, my video works, uh, photographs, you name it, is, is in there. Um, this little arrow denotes uh, it's consigned out. Uh, I can search in different ways. These dots uh, denote that they're sold works. Um, and then the other thing I can do is I can create uh, presentation documents. So I can click on these paintings either with this little flag or this little um, uh, star and I can uh, pin them uh, or I can search for them depending on cer certain key terms, like say if I wanted all the Mies van der Rohe buildings, because these are two Mies van der Rohe uh, buildings that these paintings are based on. I could search on that and then they'd all come up and then I could just straight away make a document like this. So I've done it for these Neutra paintings. I can make a PDF document in like 30 seconds to a minute, depending on the size of the, 
the PDF document of all the images, all the information that I need there, and I can send it off to a gallery. So it's, it's like having a, a personal assistant that saves a lot of time working in Word and InDesign and so on. You can also create a portfolio automatically and you can set all the different preferences in different ways. Um, ArtLogic was set up for gallerists mainly uh, at the start, but then they've uh, also um, made it for, for artists. Uh, so some of the things you feel it's more geared towards uh, the gallery world, but it, it functions absolutely fine for, um, uh, for artists as well, at least as far as I am concerned. Then this is like a loan agreement, which is similar to a consignment agreement, but this would be a loan agreement to the cultural center in, in Paris. Then you can also uh, do a, a, a stock sheet for sticking on the back of an artwork in your studio, uh, do labels and just print them off really, really easily. You can go in and search. I won't go into too much detail here because it's it's a lot to, to take on, take in and, and do. We don't have enough time, but you um, uh, have the artwork itself of all these information, uh, this information, titles, so on and so forth. Then you've got it, whether it's part of an edition, then you have general information, also search terms, whether it's being in different exhibitions, whether um, it's being included in different publications. Then you have provenance exhibitions. Uh, so also auction data can be in there. You have a financial, how much it costs, who it's sold to, which gallery it's sold with. Um, then you have a location and shipping, which can be specified to an actual location in a building, saying uh, room 101 in building in Bergen. Then you have condition reports, you have the loans, you have multiple images that you can put on there. And then on the website section, um, this is in the archive at the moment, but if I want to put it on my website, I just click a button and I've got enough space for 200 artworks from the archive. There's space for what I pay for is 1,500 artworks in the archive, but all I have to do is as long as there's space for it, I can click a button and it goes automatically to my website in that section. So it's super easy to keep your, your website up to date. Um, I mean, there, there will be other... Um, examples of that with some of uh, uh, the different website providers as well. So it's it's not that that's unique. The unique thing is that you have this um, possibility of having an archive connected to, to a website. So this is what it looks in the front end. So this is the front page of my website. And then you have the artworks, exhibitions, publications, and, and so on. And then you click on the artworks and that's where it would be directed directly to the website also with the um, uh, exhibitions. Um, then another one I just thought I'd show, um, uh, there's a, a curator, former museum director, Erland uh, Horstein, who I just talked to is the CEO, CEO of this uh, company, Locarto. Um, and uh, they have just set up, I think it's going to go live or maybe it's already gone live. Um, and it's, uh, I guess it'll be a competitor with ArtLogic and other sites like it. Um, uh, and at the moment, I think they're doing this like a special offer for it being free for, for students. ArtLogic is quite expensive. I think Locarto is going to be a good deal cheaper. Um, and then I think a lot of the other website providers are uh, more expensive, or sorry, archive providers are more expensive. Um, but uh, I've been trying this one out, Locarto, and it, it functions well as well. And I thought I'd show it to you as, as well. Uh, so this is an example of how it works. It's a similar thing. You can make a consignment agreement, you can put together a portfolio, you can uh, have the artworks in where you know where they're stored, uh, add all the artworks. You can also have a news. Um, then there's also a possibility for social aspect, uh, social media aspect to it. So I think it, in a way, is planned to be a social media platform. Um, and then you can go from the admin version to the public version, and then this is what it looks like in public. So um, it'll be a kind of a space for potentially for artists to sell their artwork, uh, for galleries to sell artwork of artists, uh, for networking opportunities. But the other kind of unique thing about Locarto, at least the way Erland uh, described it to me, is that um, it's uh, going to be, um, even if you leave the platform, 
uh, if you put the thing on here, you can have your catalog resume there for forever, I guess, for as long as the company lasts. Uh, that's different with ArtLogic because if I stop paying ArtLogic and I leave, at least at this moment in time, uh, uh, what I can do is I can extract all the images in a CSV file, but uh, the, uh, the archive, the catalog resume isn't left there as a resource uh, online. So this is what they've said why you should use Locarto, uh, start building your catalog resume, provides you a complete solution covering all needs of a lifelong professional artist career, gives you the artist's full control of your own artwork, production and whereabouts, keep track with the latest developments and statistics, brand yourself, uh, no additional technical skills needed and, and all vital information and communication in one place. Um, so you can, can look into this and as I, as I said, you could try it out because uh, there's an offer on at the minute where it's free for students if, if you're a student. Um, then just quickly, um, time-wise, we're doing okay. I think you know, I can go to questions soon. But uh, you know, most people will know of social media probably even better than me, but just a few examples of different ways artists use uh, social media. So Doug Aitken, the video artist, um, has a nice uh, Instagram account, which is worth checking out, where he has uh, different, uh, mainly, um, uh, video-based material that uh, is either material that inspires his work or um, um, kind of related to his kind of studio practice. Um, and then this is uh, Kai Guo Kuang, uh, the artist who works a lot with fireworks, and he's got a nice uh, process-based uh, Instagram account. Um, Nevo Mali, who's a friend who's representing Ireland at the uh, Venice Biennale this year, uh, just opening this week, I think. And um, uh, what she does is uh, use an Instagram to document her process, but also different events and uh, her, her studio practice, as well as installing exhibitions and so on and so forth. Uh, Chara uh, Shiota, who's a Japanese uh, artist and uh, uh, also has an interesting Instagram account. Then another thing that came up uh, during the pandemic period um, was this thing um, called the Artist Support Pledge, which some of you may uh, know about. Um, it's something that was uh, developed by an artist in, in uh, England, and it was a way of artists uh, being able to survive financially uh, during the, the pandemic. And it's a very nice system. Basically, what you do is you use that banner, that red uh, image that I just showed there now, on your Instagram account, and then you put um, an artwork or a series of artworks up on your Instagram to sell for no more uh, or can be less than these. So if you're in um, America, $200, I guess. If you're in England, 200 pounds, uh, 200 euro. Um, and you basically, uh, not including shipping, but anyone can buy the work uh, via uh, messaging you on Instagram. And every time you reach $1,000, so that's uh, five works, you pledge to buy another artist's works for $200. Um, and uh, then you build up your own collection. So it's like a peer-to-peer -peer, um, support system. You build up your own collection of artworks and it's become a, a huge uh, industry in a way, but there's no gallery uh, involved. I think a, a lot of galleries are probably quite annoyed about this, but I, I think there's ways of galleries working together with artists because it definitely is, um, you know, uh, not all artists, even if they have a gallery, are able to uh, survive that easily. So um, if, uh, if you have a good relationship with your gallery, you could say, listen, I'm going to offer these 10 works on the artist support pledge, is that okay? There are prints or whatever at the right price, that's, there's nothing. Um, you just make a, an arrangement of the gallery as if it was being consigned to something or to a, a charity or something like that. Um, and uh, but then for artists starting out, this is a this is a good way to get your work out there. And I think other galleries are looking to the artist support pledge um, uh, to to find artists that are doing well and so on. Then they've done a new version uh, quite recently, the Ukraine support pledge, which is the same uh, concept, but the proceeds. Uh, go to um, the Ukraine support pledge, 
and you can look into that as well if uh, you're interested uh, in um, uh, supporting that with with your artwork. Uh, so it was uh, the gallerist curator Xavier Ellis of Ellis Smith Projects and uh, Matthew Burrows who uh, started the Artist Support Pledge. So they're they're doing that. So you can find that out all of that out on the Artist Support Wedge Pledge website. Then just quickly, I mean, I use Instagram for mainly studio activities, and then I use um, uh, Facebook for uh, events and uh, exhibitions and so on, and then sometimes to document a whole uh, body of work from an exhibition uh, on, on Facebook as well, uh, because you know, that's the, the way I've chosen to use it, but you can, you can do it in any, that was Annika Erickson's uh, uh, Facebook, so you can kind of see there, she's got like a, a not notification about uh, uh, an exhibition that she's taking part in. Um, then also Twitter, I'm not on Twitter, but uh, you know, it's something to search from time to time is to find out stuff that's been uh, posted uh, relating to your yeah, world or your brand or whatever you want to call it. Um, that can be posted on other social media platforms and to kind of maintain an overview of that. Uh, then I thought I'd just mention quickly about NFTs. I'm quite skeptical of them because of the environmental impact of, of NFTs because they, they use blockchain technology and they have a, a huge ener energy consumption. Um, so even though they're quite a, a democratic uh, way of getting digital art out there and and anybody can can get involved the uh, environmental uh, not just in terms of energy but actually in terms of consumption of of hardware and, and minerals is uh, because it burn in order to do this blockchain expect more bitcoin and so on uh, you're burning out hardware um, over time as, as well uh, so uh, yeah, but it may be something that uh, suits your work and, and you're interested in. They are trying to, to figure out new, um, new ways of making them less, less environmentally problematic. So uh, don't have time to go into maybe in the chat or discussion afterwards, we can talk about NFTs and what they mean and everything, but I, I can explain that for anybody who doesn't know if you want to hear that. But there's lots of documentation online about that. And then just to stop finish off um got one minute to go before we go to to questions um i've got a few books here so like the one the other ones i mentioned before um these are uh, some that will be so in a similar genre but then uh, jerry salt he's got a new book coming out but this is his previous book how to be an artist it's it's quite good fun and informative uh, so I'd recommend to, to read that. Also, even better is Michael Craig Martin's On Being an Artist, um, really short texts, which are maybe more philosophical takes on life and, and uh, on being an artist. And then you have Hans Ulrich Obrist's The Do It Compendium, which I think is a great book as well, the, uh, documenting the Do It project that he set up with uh, Christian Boltanski uh, way back, I guess, maybe in the 90s now. Um, and uh, it's, it's quite inspiring. And you have this one, which is uh, dealing with creative block, um, which uh, is also an interesting book uh, and uh, find out how artists have dealt with uh, creative block and with art world challenges in a refreshing manner. I think Yeppe Hein actually wrote a book about his breakdown of, uh, due to stress in the art world as well. I haven't read it, but I think it's supposed to be a good book as well. Um, and then taking the leap, building a career as a visual artist, insider's guide to exhibiting and selling your art is another um, uh, good book. Again, you just need to find the one that's right for you. Uh, Essential guide for building your career as an artist. There, there, there'll be a lot of repetition in these, so you don't need to buy all of them. It's just a matter of kind of finding the ones that, that fit you. Um, Living and Sustaining a Creative Life, Essays by 40 Working Artists. That's quite a nice one where it kind of goes into the nitty gritty side of making a living as an artist from kind of case studies. Artist Guide to How to Make a Living uh, Doing What You Love. And then a few apps that would be just uh, useful. There's Hootsuite if you want to 
gather together. I don't use it, but I mean, if you want to gather together all your social media and if you use social media a lot, either in your work or for promoting your work, then this is a way of kind of uh, pulling it all together and being able to, to post on multiple platforms and save time. Uh, then Evernote is quite good, but you can also use uh, put, you know, notes in, uh, on your Mac computer or in uh, PC reminders, and you can even use Google calendars, which is free. Um, uh, but Evernote is maybe a slightly more sophisticated way of uh, reminding yourself what's happening and when deadlines are coming up and uh, address lists for sending out um, invitations, all these different things. Um, then I use uh, Google SketchUp for uh, talking with uh, curators about uh, uh, especially during the pandemic period, either for putting together proposals or for um, doing walkthroughs of placement of works. So, and, and especially when you're collaborating with other artists in an exhibition, say it's a group exhibition, it's quite useful. So that previous one was a proposal for a show. This is a show I had a couple of years ago in Zurich and I was just talking to the, the curators about the uh, placement of the works. Uh, this was a show in Denmark which uh, again, it was happening during the pandemic a bit and I also needed to place some large installations uh, in the gallery space. And I needed to figure out the scale of the installations, but also explain to the curators um, what um, it would look like in the space because we were going to be transporting the works there. Uh, you can see the actual end result on my website if you're interested to to see it, but as a way of, of thinking out loud, uh, discussing things together, deciding placement of works, also fabrication. So this was a piece I had at the Norwegian Sculpture Biennale a few years ago in Oslo, and uh, all of these measurements are uh, to, to scale. So I was able to talk with a fabricator in Oslo because I couldn't make it in my studio and ship it because the costs were too high. So we made it all in Oslo. And I was able to communicate to him about the, the fabrication. Um, and then just the last thing is uh, a different website opportunities, but I'm sure most people uh, know these already. So you've got wordpress.com, which is for free. Then you've got Wix. Uh, and to sum up, uh, uh, establish, number one, establish and maintain value of your work. So that was back to the pricing. Professionalize and maintain your documentation and archiving of your work. Establish a website and keep it up to date. Establish and maintain an active network of peers, mentors, and collaborators. I forgot to mention that was very important, is to really share each other's um, applications, especially early on in your career, proofread for your friends and um, uh, look at portfolios together. You know, just if you're an artist, set up an artist studio uh, collaborative um, and, and just work together and help each other. It's a competitive world, but it's also a world where you can actually gain a lot by being together and not being being alone. So don't think of it, you know, we're all in our own uh, worlds of producing our work, but it doesn't mean that we're competing in that in that sense. Um, use available online and offline resources to broaden your your network and promote your artwork. Uh, make plans and targets, but don't feel beholden to them and treat them as a process. What do you want for your art career? What do you want to see happening in your artwork in the next six months or six years? Remember, it's okay to say no and protect yourself and your brand. Consignment agreements are a must and get professional advice when signing contracts. That is that. Sorry if that was a lot. Hope <laughs> it was okay. No, I think we're good. Thank you so much, Iman, for uh, this uh, very insightful and extensive talk on the subject. I think uh, everyone really got uh, some some very good, um, yeah, uh, tools and uh, um, also examples and an insight into how you do things, how other artists do things. So I really, I really enjoyed the whole, uh, yeah, the whole talk. And I, I saw that um, there are more, uh, I think there are some extra questions in the chat. So uh, maybe we can just, and, and in the meanwhile, if people have other questions, we won't like extend the talk very long, but if you have an extra question, if, uh, if there is something that you would like to ask Iman, 
uh, please just yeah, raise your hand or the same, write it there. And maybe we just take the ones that are there. Um, I think we left it at, there was a question by uh, Rui Liu. How should an already made artist uh, value their own work? Which... Yeah, so that's a, that's a really good question. So it re relates back to what I was saying about the factor system. Um, so if you have um, uh, priced your work from before, then of course you should stick to that. Uh, you shouldn't go lower uh, than that price. Of course, if you priced it way too high and you're finding that you're unhappy with that, then maybe that's something to reassess as uh, even if you're not working with a gallery, just to kind of figure out a way around that. But the price it shouldn't go down. But if um, you what what you mean, uh, Rui, is um, uh, how to uh, value the own work kind of going forward, um, it's based on uh, establishing a system. It could be the factor system. It could be the cost in your practice system that I was talking about, or it could be even your own system. Um, the factor system is kind of by a square meter size or, uh, you know, based on the scale of the thing and the cost in the practice is based more on time and uh, materials and, and other things. So it depends what you feel most comfortable with. Um, but then once you've established that base level of a, of a price, then your work should go up from there but but be careful not to go to go up too fast be patient with it because you want your collectors to to follow you um over time so you might have younger people buying your work or people with a smaller budget that are buying your work and then as your work gets more established maybe they can't afford to have your work but it was quite nice that they could afford it early on um, and then maybe you have, if your work is, is going well and the, the, your career is going well, then you start beginning to put the prices up. You probably put your price up, um, you know, once every uh, two to five years or something like that, uh, depending on how your career is going. But for example, if you suddenly have a solo show in your national museum or in a major biennale, then that can also be an excuse to... Uh, Put the prices up because there might be a, a lot of interest in that um, but regarding the how to figure out what your factor is you if, if your work is a painting or a photograph you just uh, uh, take the price in euro uh, you divide it you add together the height and the, the width and then you uh, divide that into the price in euro and then you get your your factor uh, and of course it's uh, would be uh, or should be cheaper if the work is an additioned work, uh, if it's a uh, uh, print or uh, maybe even a photograph. Hope that uh, answers the question. Yeah, and um, I was just uh, scrolling through the questions. Uh, I just wanted to take the one uh, next because I think maybe it connects a bit. Uh, so there was a question from Bogdan Teodorescu that um, there, uh, there are there. It's maybe easier for some artists that work only in in one field, or focus on one field to develop uh, a brand than than artists that work with uh, many subjects or more media. So, yeah, this this question is really close to my heart because I have this problem all the time. Uh, I work with so many different media that um, I think sometimes it's like shooting myself in the foot because, you know, uh, sometimes I'll meet um, curators or gallerists and they, they think I'm a painter. Other times I meet the, another group of people, they, they think I work with interactive installation. Others have only seen my video work. Um, and that's also kind of my fault because I've always um, uh, kept these things a little bit separate uh, until recently. Um, and that's a kind of a practical uh, thing in terms of giving the work space and also being true to the, my working process, because even though I work on things simultaneously uh, and work in lots and lots of different media simultaneously, um, I like to um, curate them into, I guess, um, rooms of 
particular works so that an installation would be in one room and then maybe a video work would be in another room and so on. Um, but it, it is a bit confusing for the outside world sometimes to see, especially if they come and visit my studio to see how it all makes sense. What I would say is just be uh, patient with this because when I started putting my website together uh, or redesigning my website and, and doing the archive, um, it was a moment for reflection and I began to see, okay, these things are connected in a way. It may be through color, it may be through certain forms, it may be through a conceptual starting point and so on, but things by and large began to, to, to hold together. But what I would uh, really, uh, um, I think this is the undertone of your, your question, Bogdan, is that what I would really say is not to try and change your practice to suit some idea of what your your idea of what a brand or what other people think your brand should be you know not to try and modify it for the market um, uh, even if people are getting confused and so on uh, there will be things that they uh, of course certain curators certain gallerists might uh, avoid an artist because they find it too confusing and that the brand isn't clear enough and so on. But maybe you weren't meant to work with that person in a way in, in, uh, because they're, they're not the right match. Um, so uh, I, th I think it's, it's, it's important to be true to your, your own world and your own, own work. And once you start putting the things together, those, those connections start to become apparent. And then that's a, a, a design question. And if you keep your website simple and clear, um, then those connections are easier to make for yourself and for the public as well. Uh, and think about it as well that over a timeline, uh, you know, looking back on uh, 10 years of work or 20 years of work, then of course you can see the difference in repetition, but you also can uh, uh, identify that uh, uh, things that you might want to go back to from maybe 20 years ago or something uh, that, that you're interested in. So it's, it's a useful critical tool for critical reflection. There was also this question uh, talking about uh, uh, putting together or making uh, this unified uh, maybe image of the brand about the difference between the artist's brand and the artist's identity. So the question was, how do we make sure that they complement and sustain each other always? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, it's very it's interesting. In line, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it's, it is along the same line. And I think, um, I mean, I think the, this is where the, a little bit of what I was talking about at the beginning of the talk, where one has to be careful of not taking a, a kind of business branding model and applying it wholesale to your artist identity. You know, the you need to keep your your uh, artist identity kind of protected from these. Uh, keep a space in a way, like uh, Mark Leckie's talking about the paradise of the work. You need to keep the space of play and inventiveness and exploration and also your own identity because it's very easy to get lost um, if you're trying to think about a coherent brand and um, uh, but of course you know i think there's another aspect of branding which is this idea of of clarity and what I keep coming back to when I'm talking about uh, portfolio preparation or website preparation is just the simpler, the better. Let the work speak for itself. It may seem uh, boring, but just not overly designing things and giving the information that is needed, like the scale of the work, the, the medium, all these different things. And then that can be uh, the brand, those subtle like what type of font you use, uh, whether it's a white background or a black background or different, they seem like really small things, but that in conjunction with the work, like you saw the, the websites that I showed today, and they're also different. I mean, some of them are a bit similar, but you see from David Shrigley to Andrea Zittel to Francis Elise, they're all doing slightly different things. And that is both uh, a branding structure, but it's also reflecting the artist identity. So I think that um that's your question you know comes back to uh 
and Andrea, the, the question is, is how do they complement and sustain each other? It's that balance of letting the work speak for itself, but also uh, preserving your identity through, through the branding that you're using. Great. Um, there was also this interesting, um, uh, so I think we have three more questions because one is kind of merged into one. Mm -hmm. um, how helpful is an artist residency organized by a gallery or an artist run space and how he or she, the artist could take all the advantages from such an experience? I, I think artist residencies are, are fantastic. Uh, I mean, um, I mean, even just research trips like the one I'm on, which is a, a university organized research trip, but to, to kind of stimulate your practice, to, to meet other people, to present your work in another context, to make your work in another context uh, is, is really, really good uh, thing to take, take on board. Um, the one thing I would say is it doesn't always work so well with life. <laughs> Because, of course, uh, if you've got other commitments, if you've got family, partner, kids, you know, some residencies are really open to that. But I've experienced a few residencies that, you know, for example, don't don't allow you to to uh, travel with your partner and your children. Um, and uh, so, so yeah, it, it is a kind of a balance. And of course, it could be very easily become a quite a nomadic um, lifestyle as well of moving from residency to residency but it's it's also a very very good way of building your network um uh, mihai's uh, question is related to uh, one organized by a gallery now if that was a public institution you know for example i've done a residency at the irish cultural center in paris and also exhibitions there then you know that's sort of a one-off thing and that can be practical as well because can produce the work there and then the work can get exhibited there that's not the way it worked out when when i did the re residency there but that can also be kind of a financial benefit uh, benefit uh, to both parties as well to kind of have an exhibition at the end of the residency and so on the work being produced there so it kind of keeps the costs down um, but i do know that there are some uh, residencies that uh, commercial galleries um, have for their their artists as well and then that gives an opportunity to show, uh, well, to help the artist make new work, uh, but also to maybe show the work in a, in a different context and not have that um, issue of the, the shipping to that particular context. Um, so um, I think there's there's lots of different advantages uh, from it, but you know, you shouldn't be paying for residencies. You know, this is a, something that you're. Uh, giving as a service you should have you know a monthly or weekly stipend uh some material budget you know even if it's a small gesture and especially for artists run residency programs and so on but an artist uh, is providing normally uh, supposed to provide some sort of cultural input within the local context and that's also very important so um you know just like i said before you shouldn't be paying galleries for the opportunity to show in New York or something you also shouldn't be paying for um, a residency program even though there are some some out there but that's just my opinion others might have a different opinion on that yeah I, I kind of totally agree that there are very um, yeah there are a lot of advantages and I think the network networking part is also very important and the time that you have to just make your work I think it's yeah, not from an artist's perspective, of course, but just this collaborating with artists and they, they always uh, have told me this, the same about it. Definitely. Um, uh, there, there, there was a question though about, um, uh, regarding your example, maybe Iman, it, it connects with it, that um, someone was asking, is, is it possible to sell artworks produced while having a state funded grant? I don't know if you ever encountered this situation in your practice. Um, I don't think it's it's a problem where it, where it does come into a certain uh, problem is, um, for example, production costs. So uh, in the past, I've had um, uh, artworks where uh, I produced a series of photographs uh, with a publicly funded gallery that was funded you know production costs were funded 
And there seemed to be an issue, this is many, many years ago, like 22 years ago or something now. So maybe it's a bit different now, but there was a kind of an issue around, uh, it was so long ago, it was actually a laser disc, um, which is this huge, it's almost the size of an LP that used to be before uh, DVDs. And it was this huge laser disc that I had, had produced for this exhibition for a video installation. Um, and uh, I wasn't able to keep the laser disc uh, afterwards because it was kind of, in a way, owned by the, the publicly funded institution. It's a slightly different thing, but I mean, I guess um, because it was it was funded by it, they they were of the opinion that this wasn't uh, possible. And then, of course, that means you know if you were uh, to sell something, then you would have to produce it again. But um, I don't think it would be an issue, like say, if you're making drawings or paintings uh, on a grant, because uh, of course it depends on the grant. It, it, if there's a contract there, um, it should be clear in the contract. You definitely, um, as an artist, you still own the copyright, even if you, uh, like say, if it's a public uh, funded uh, public commission, the 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 building or the public art Norway or something they own it um, but you as the artist still own the copyright to the the artwork so you still have those those rights um, but I, I don't think it's an issue but I don't know if you've had any experiences Christina that um, where, it, where it would be an issue it, I think it uh, I was also going to add to this that it, it also depends on the um, on the consignment agreement or, or this kind of co initial contract that yeah, that's yeah. in you have to pay attention in the beginning what are the conditions um in response to i think alexandra's question was that yeah what what kind of uh, framework legal framework or um yeah um further framework for um after the the show or the commission finishes what how is that established and then it might be an issue, I think, depending also um, on the country, but um, yeah. Yeah, and I, and I think, like you say, you know, if it is stipulated, like say you do a residency and it's a funded residency and then it's stipulated in the contract that you sign for the residency that you're supposed to leave a donation of an artwork behind, that that can often be, be the case. Um, so just just make sure that you read the contract beforehand and if you're not happy with it then you need to ask for amendments to the contract or come to an agreement um, but i don't think it's a, a written uh, thing in terms of publicly funded uh, grants uh, there may be uh, tax things related to it that you'd need to take into consideration but nothing in terms of like um, selling a painting that you've produced whilst uh, getting money because that's what it's what you're meant to produce and also it's meant to advance your art career as well um, that's what the money is put into is to to support culture more people were um and this is i think the last question and after this we will wrap it up um more people were asking how is the situation different in terms of artist branding for an older artist like with older with quotation marks, but um, yeah, I think it's it's maybe because the perception is that also galleries, as was written in in the question of, of Bogdan as well, that they look for mainly young artists or fresh, or um, it's is easier to work with them. And how should an older artist um, start or deal with yeah this uh, situation? Yeah, I, I guess I'm in that category. I'm getting to be, I'm 47 now, so I'm getting to be, be older. Um, so I understand the, the question. Maybe it's written uh, from the perspective of being older again. Um, but I think luckily the art world is changing so rapidly, uh, both in good and bad ways. But one of the good ways it's been changing is, you know, people like uh, Etta Ladan, Rose Wiley, um, uh, you know, so especially a lot of older uh, women artists are just getting the recognition that they they deserve now. Uh, the museum collections are going through massive um, uh, reassessment of their collections, uh, and it's it's changing the whole landscape. One would hope that it then kind of reaches a, a, a kind of a point that 
means that this focus on youth and because I think the, the youth thing very much goes out of a kind of art market thing of of like speculation and um, you know uh, buying an artist's work when they're young and then uh, selling it off when when the prices get high and so on. Uh, so that's a little bit where the, the focus kind of comes about. And I think the art world's becoming a bit more nuanced than that. And even the the debate around the Turner Prize when it was all artist collectives that were being um, nominated uh, and then actually the Array Collective won it. Um, they uh, they were saying, oh, this is the end of the individual artists. But what they, the, the critics didn't uh, realize is that these were all uh, artists of many different ages uh, all with their own individual practices, uh, very often uh, collaborating together. So it's just different forms of uh, just like we have the educational turn or the relational aesthetic turn that um, there's there's kind of different things that have evolved within the art work world. And I, I feel quite uh, positive about um, how things will develop in the future. Um, and I think it's just a matter of um maybe getting your catalog resonate together like i'm suggesting you know to uh, get your stuff out there and seen because you know um having a good website that uh documents the work uh, will mean that um an artist can be reevaluated if it's stuck in an attic somewhere and nobody is getting to see it then you will have a situation a bit like what happened to hilma afklint that it's uh, after after uh, many years uh, after she dies that then uh, her work comes to be shown at the Guggenheim and other places. So uh, I think there was also another just quick question here about a few art related podcasts that I like to listen to. Um, and I could just say that quickly. I listened to uh, two ones by the artist newspaper. One is called The Brush With, and that's where the Mark Leckie quote is from. Um, it's an interview podcasts where they interview um, different uh, uh, different artists um, about their practice. It's really nice. And then there's an art newspaper weekly podcast that sort of uh, talks about the different shows on internationally and different things in the art market and so on. Uh, then the David Zwerner Dialogues podcast is really good um, uh, with Lucas Zwerner and we, and we had Lucas talk to the students uh, on a Zoom call uh, last semester. And then uh, Sean Kelly's, uh, he's paused it for the moment, but it's called Collect Wi Wisely, Sean Kelly Gallery, Collect Wisely, if you're interested in hearing how art collectors think about, um, uh, about art and their collections and so on. And then the last one I listened to is called um, uh, Talk Art with uh, uh, Robert Diamant and uh, Russell Tovey, and they, um, they normally interview art artists and curators about um, about the art world. So that's a few. I can I can type them into the chat or or add them into the the the, uh, the sheet I prepare at the, the for for putting online. Great, thank you, Iman, so much for uh, giving us all this input <laughs> and the references. Great. Um, I just also want to mention that, um, yeah, there, uh, there will be uh, two more workshops from this series. So, and also um, in terms of, of resources and, and, and finding um, more of them, you can also follow this for us and we will post this, um, we will post this recording and um, also on our, um, pages on both pages, this Penn Sector One Gallery, uh, the dates for the next workshops will be announced. Um, yeah, they will be uh, probably uh, by the end of this year and also next year. So in terms of, of time frame, but uh, we will uh, keep you guys updated on uh, social media, which is important, like we <laughs> we all know and uh, Iman was telling. So um, thanks so much to everyone. Um, and thanks again, Iman. And I think we all uh, really had a good time. Thank you, Christina, and, uh, and everybody for, for attending. And uh, yeah, it was a real pleasure. Hopefully it wasn't too much to take in, but um, uh, yeah, gives an overview of, of what uh, 
the possibilities are out there. Yeah, I think it, it was it was great. And also in terms of the fact that the participants were from different contexts and um, um, I think that there are some things related to the subject which are quite, a co which are common. So this is the great that um, could get an insight into that and kind of this, um, let's say a base to work with and um, yeah, be able to expand this in terms of context for, for each of them. Absolutely. Thanks again. Well, lovely to meet you all and uh, bye have bye. a wonderful, wonderful day. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye.